On this episode of The Eternities, the therapist, lifestyle coach, and YouTuber Connor McMillan, aka Handyman Bananas, and the lifestyle coach and YouTuber Brittany Taylor. Unfortunately, due to making this podcast while traveling under equipped in Thailand, sound quality suffered badly. There is a transcript of the first interview available at theeternities.com, while the second interview with Brittany is easier to follow via the audio itself. Colin McMillan is a therapist and lifestyle coach with a popular YouTube channel, Handyman Bananas. Just three years ago, he was addicted to drugs and alcohol, and now believes that eating a high fruit diet is a key factor in his rapid recovery. I caught up with Connor at the recent Fruit Winter Festival, which he now organizes each January in Chiang Mai, Thailand. I started the interview by asking him how the idea for Fruit Winter came about. Fruit Winter came about from me being out here in Thailand two years ago and traveling around and finally coming to Chiang Mai and meeting up with friends. And after about a month of like being alone and traveling alone and having a hard time at it, I met up with friends here in Chiang Mai and it was just like, ah, oh, that's what traveling is all about. And I like felt so good. I sunk into it immediately, fell in love with Chiang Mai and just wanted to recreate it. And so last year I just came up with the idea of having some meetups, coming up with a festival name and seeing what what would happen. And we ended up having about 40 people come last year. But you planned it before you arrived. You didn't just do it, did you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I planned it about six months before I arrived um, last year. And then again, after it was moderately successful with 40 people, I felt like let's keep going. And so this year, got right into it, planned all the events. Um, yeah. Well, why why do a um, a meetup based on on fruit and mm-hmm. um, would the high high fruit diet, vegan diet? Why do that? Yeah. Um, I think because it's a good focus for people who want to get into a health journey. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be that you attend the festival because you're vegan or you attend the festival because you eat a lot of fruit in your diet. Mm. But really it's just something like everyone can get in on eating some bananas mm. or coming to Thailand and being excited about Thai mangoes and durian and these kinds of things. So I think at this point for me, my focus is community. The caveat is fruit. Uh, it's a good banner for people to kind of rally under, but I do want to steer it in a direction of being more open rather than a vegan-centered. Right. So, uh, when's the next one, and what can people expect when it comes out? Uh, the next one is January 8th to the 17th, and that's in uh, 2016. Um, they can expect 10 meetups every day that are free. So one meetup every day, we're going to ride to the quarry, um, we're going to ride to the caves, to some hot springs, we're going to go to the lake, we're also just going to get together at a restaurant, at a park, and we are going to eat a lot of fruit, but I think the big thing is we're going to all get to know each other in an amazing country where people are smiling and relaxed and happy and the sun is shining. So again, like for me, it's really about establishing and maintaining community and relation with people in an authentic and honest way. And do you think that there's something about, I mean, you just said that there's something about the country, there's something about the mm. like, Do you think that there really is that, that, that big a difference here? Yeah, yeah, I do. I was thinking about it last night, like, uh, I got a massage yesterday with my friend, and these women were just laughing and smiling the whole time, you know? And this is, they're working. They're working and massaging us and just giggling and having a chat. And I was just thinking about how many people I see smiling in Thailand every single day, every single hour. I get the feeling that this, they sort of accept wh- where they're at, whereas mm-hmm. back in the West, it's like we're trying to get somewhere else than, we, than where we are. That's yeah. exactly it. It's a state of presence, you know, and contentment in that present moment. Because the present moment, generally speaking, is like pretty satisfactory. <laughs> and I think that they're in that. But it's hard to get to it. It's hard to get to it. And I think it's a lot easier to get to it when you're surrounded by a lot of other people who are in it. 
Um, I know this year you had a house um, where a lot of people could stay at yeah. during the festival. Are you going to do that again next year? Same thing. Uh, arrange, talk to the house. Um, the owners of the house already this year lined it up for next year. We're all set. So basically offering 30 tickets um, are going to be available. We haven't come up with the prices of exactly what that's going to include. But, you know, that's that might be an addition for some people who need a little bit of help, um, a tighter community to get to Thailand. And some of the people who, who came this year wouldn't have done it without the house. So. But the rest of the fest was entirely free. I would say that it does definitely sort of engender a community um, feel and a lot of collections and bonds yeah. and natural space of life. So, how would you describe your own diet and lifestyle, and, and you know, how did you how would you get there? Um, <laughs> let's see. I think I've told this story a bunch of times, and it always kind of changes for me, which is good. Um, so I'm just, I'm just, it's good to reflect and see where I'm at now. I eat a fruit-based diet. And, uh, and I have been doing that for about two and a half years. And I came to it because I needed something drastic to shift my life. And I guess I, I paused a little bit because that's the thing that I used to, to get to a different place. And I would say what's most important to me now is self-understanding, self-knowledge, self-observation, all in the goal of self-love. And fruit kind of helped me get there. Um, did, you, did you know that's where you wanted to go? No, I didn't. I didn't know that. So what I say to people now is that people who want to change their lives, I really try and gear them towards like the self-love aspect rather than like, don't worry about the diet so much. Like the other stuff will fall into place. Um, but for some people, it, it does happen in a strange way. And for me, it was kind of, I do think it's kind of strange and funny that I started eating 30 bananas in a day, and then eventually finding ways to love myself more. What were you thinking <laughs> when, you, when you decided to eat the I, I was thinking that I need to do something. And uh, I was drinking every single day. I had just gone through a really hard separation with um, with my now ex-wife, my wife at the time, a relationship that was 12 years long, starting when I was 16 years old. Uh, that was a big deal. It was very traumatic for me. And Along the way in that relationship, which had elements that were incredible, um, now reflecting on that, I see areas where I've really lost myself and aspects of myself. In the relationship? Yeah, in the relationship, yeah. And and because of that, I was un unhappy. And so I started drinking more and finding these other ways to supplement my happiness, my natural happiness. And when I kind of realized where I was at, um, alone, kind of addicted to alcohol, painkillers, cigarettes, pastrami sandwiches, you know, you name it, I was like, God, something's got to change. And a buddy of mine told me about this diet, and I just thought, like, hey, let's try that. You know, I'll try anything. I'll try it. So I just switched, like, just like that, you know, pretty much overnight. I quit drinking, quit smoking, quit doing drugs, quit pastrami, and went like 100% raw fruitarian uh, within six weeks. I mean, excuse me, seven days. And it, it felt good. It, 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 it did. did. It did, yeah. Yeah, it felt great. It did, felt, you, did you have the sort of withdrawal or any kind of weird detox stuff going on? The, mm -hmm. the funny thing is I, I really didn't um, get too much. I got a very, a very slight headache. Um, I was sleeping a lot more. But in general, my detox is really like so, what would be the advice for someone who wants to go into something like this diet? How do you do it? I wouldn't do it the way that I did it. Um, yeah, I wouldn't switch, I wouldn't jump right into it unless that's kind of your personality and you've had success doing that before and that's fun for you or whatever. But you don't have to do it like that. You don't have to be extreme. Um, I see that, I see my transition as kind of unhealthy at least not. You know, I did it for a good reason, it worked in, in some ways, but. I backslid a lot in a lot of different ways. Um, I had to do a lot of catch up. And so I would say discover what the reasons are that you want to make these changes. What's holding you back from making these changes? Learning about those parts of you that are involved in that process. 
bringing compassion and love to yourself, and then gently guiding that process. So to, to consciously let these challenges rather than just radically to do something yeah. in the extreme way. That's right. <clears throat> so if you now become someone who is leading the way, and you know, for the people who want to go into this lifestyle, you've got a YouTube channel, you've got a website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what, what is the YouTube channel about? Um, it's been, uh, now it's really about me being as honest as I can about my personal experiences. And that I've found has given me a great relief and a relationship with YouTube that I really enjoy. In the past, I've had a YouTube channel for over two years. In the past, it's been like, sometimes I think about it more as a business venture, sometimes I think about it more as just fun. So it's, um, it's been a little all over the place, and I think uh, ultimately I've found I get the most from people when they just tell me their honest truth. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I want to give people the most that I can without my honest truth. So that's where I'm at with the channel. So it's very personal, it's about your exam. Very personal, yeah. Okay, so it's not, it's not just an advice mm -hmm. to me. No, no I, I would say for me it's about mainly about my personal journey. Um, you offer some sort of like, maybe you want to try this too, because yeah. this is what works for me, but I'm, I really stay away from do this because you'll get this, because I don't know what you're going to get out of it. Um, I also steer away from talking about fruit and diet and you know, veganism or anything like that, because it doesn't really, I'm not that passionate about it, you know, I'm more passionate about self-love, self-love. Uh, self so, do you have a website um, mm -hmm. with some... So books, it? Like you get coaching? Yeah. Tell me what you offer. Like sure. Yeah, I have um, a really big recipe book for people who do want to get started on a raw, fruit-based, heart-based diet. Um, and then I also offer coaching as well as therapy. So I have um, um, both those options. Okay, so um, what is the therapy that you offer? The therapy I offer is called Internal Family Systems IFS. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with your external family. It's all based on your internal family. And uh, it's, it's just what I'm talking about, developing compassion for the parts of us that exist. And I think that compassion is kind of the most self-love. And where does that tradition come from? What about that would be the tradition? It's been around for a couple of decades, uh, developed by a guy named Richard Schwartz. Um, but I think the methodology has existed in a lot of different forms uh, in a lot of different places. And a huge aspect of IFS is mindfulness, which Daniel Siegel talks about um, pioneering interpersonal neurobiology. Uh, mindfulness is a state of self observation. And from the state, we find a sense of peace, calm, um, relaxation, and indeed love there. And from that place, learning about ourselves is really safe and kind of guides health in a very natural way. So how can you help people by using this um, in a coaching one-to-one -one session? Yeah, so the therapy is set up with certain protocols that work within the IFS uh, schema. And the coaching is more about getting connected with the person on like a more one-to-one -one level, I guess, without the kind of therapist, client, setup, okay. and, and, but using IFS a lot in the coaching as well. So, how, how have all these things come together in your life now? I mean, um, where, where are you at in your journey? I would say that I'm, I mean, I'm still in the infancy of my journey, and, um, and I also would say I've done a ton of work in the last couple of years. What started out as kind of like a, a refining of my diet, which I sort of thought was going to be the answer to everything, has turned into this quest of learning about myself and sort of bringing my experiences about that process to others. Um, and what is it? What is the thing to learn? You know, to, to somebody that is maybe you know buried by their environment and their, their background and they. They can't even understand, you know, they can't even begin to sort of get what you're talking about. I mean, how do you explain what, what does that mean? You know, what you're talking about? That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I would say I used to be, maybe this is helping to just reflect on, on where I used to be. Um, I used to be just an anxious all the time. 
with either anxiety, depression, um, or kind of like some giddy, like drunken stupor. Like an escape as well. The giddy, the giddiness is the escape from the, from the line. Mm -hmm. The kind of constant anxiety and depression. There were other things wrapped up in that. Um, so learning about myself has been learning about why I've been in these states of mind. And it's not just a chemical imbalance. No, no, no. There's reasons, 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 reasons for reasons. your background, and everyone's background. And so I found that through listening to other people's experiences and also learning about childhood trauma, learning about neurobiology, learning about how to raise children, learning about. You know, so there's lots of different places you can start. Um, and honestly, I would say picking up a book or, or uh, listening to a podcast or watching a YouTube video on something like internal performance systems is really helpful. That has, that has been what has gotten me the most. And you can use self work with IFS. That's how I start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, can you talk a little bit more about IFS? Just give us a yeah. little bit more of an insight into how it works. Yeah, for <clears throat> sure. Um, so, IFS uh, works off the principle of the mind as a multiplicity system. So, we so rather than thinking about our mind as one computer, we think about it as a bunch of different computers running the same. A, a, little, di a little digression today sure. in, in the Independent in the newspaper. There's an article about a new way of dealing with people with their voices, schizophrenia, and so on. And what they're doing is they're listening to it, they're talking to it, and they're, they're seeing them as responses to traumas and abuse and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's working with us about it. That's beautiful to hear. Yeah, in, uh, it, that's kind of exactly the kind of thing that we do at IFS. And, and in fact, um, Richard Schwartz talks about um, extreme multiplicity and that this has sort of been uh, diagnosed as a disease or a dysfunction of the brain. But really, we just see it as extreme polarization of parts. And parts, or family members, internal family members, is something that we all have. We all run the problem of, you know, quote unquote, the problem of life through a bunch of different computers. Because we find like running running them through a whole bunch of different computers is a lot faster than running them through a parallel process. I mean, that's right. Yeah, exactly. So, what we do in IFS is get to know, we try and do something um, called unblending, where we can find this place of mindfulness uh, somewhere inside of us that is centered, that is relaxed, calm patient and curious and compassionate, and then learn about these different computers and these different parts of ourselves from that place. So this part of me that was feeling anxiety, you know, I got to learn about that part. Why are you there? And what can you do for me? Oh, wow. You do that for me? Wow, I'm so impressed. And I love you for that. Thank you. So there's nothing about, you have to change. I hate you. Get in the basement. You know, get out of here. Stuff it down. Push it away. It's all about bring it closer. Give it a hug. And, and that uses that anxious part. That's right. Yeah. Why should that be? I mean, why is it anxious in the first place? Is it just yeah. that it's sort of been um, mobilized too much? Mm -hmm. It's just overactive for us? Is that the case? We're giving it too much energy or giving it too little energy? I think that's that's all depending on the person. Yeah, yeah there's there's no two parts that are going to be the same. Just so no two people are going to be the same. So my anxiety developed from you know childhood trauma, and a lot of it is just neglect. Really simple stuff. You didn't get a hug when you, when you needed a hug. And something developed out of that. That's traumatic. And so you go, water on stone as well. Yeah, that's right. Really cool. And then it's there It's there forever until it gets hot. And a lot of the time, what we, what we find is we can be our own character, and we can hug those parts that are trapped in that moment in the free world. And that's a revelation because we do look outside ourselves, whether it's to drink or food or drugs or exactly. any kind of distraction. And, and the key is actually to do it ourselves. That's right. We don't, even, we don't even need that? another part of religious. No. Yeah. No, not at all. In fact, I would say, you know, if you want to find a partner who really loves you, find it in yourself and then go out there and see that person who also found it in themselves. 
So you, now you're trying to, or you are in a position, <coughs> excuse me, where you are making a living mm -hmm. by um, plowing all this back in to you know a livelihood. You know, you talk a bit about the desire to do that, you know, um, rather than go and get another job, maybe pay <laughs> more or whatever. Right. And what does that mean to you? Yeah. You know, working on these things that have really helped you and also doing free painting that helps you and so on. Yeah. Well, it's mind blowing. You know, it's living my dream. I never thought I'd find my a passion. I've been passionate about it. I've been about it. I've been about it. Now I feel like I'm living passion. My life is literally changing. I mean, I just, my reality is completely different reality. Um, it's everything to me, and I couldn't imagine doing anything else. So I did at some point have a hope and a desire and a dream to live this life. I'm not really sure exactly what that meant. I mean, but I do remember laying in bed and drinking beer, you know, wanting to change so bad, and watching some YouTube videos of some healthy people in Thailand. This was like three years ago. I'm thinking to myself, God. Ah, and there were parts of me that I totally didn't think I could. But there was a part of me that I had hope. There was a part of me that I had to be in the fire. And now all my parts are here with me at the time. <laughs> Living that dream. Good place to end. Brittany Taylor is a lifestyle coach who also has a popular YouTube channel called Simple Living and Travel. Three years ago, she downsized her life, leaving a job and home to become a digital nomad as a location independent IT consultant in order to follow her dream of a lifestyle of optimal nutrition, physical movement, and play. I spoke to Brittany at the recent Pre Winter Festival and started the interview by asking her about her website and YouTube channel. So my website is called simplelivingandtravel.com and it's basically just, right now it's just articles and um, mostly geared towards YouTube I guess. So the website has some articles and my YouTube channel has videos based around simple living, travel, kind of like minimalist ideas around how to simplify your life and like in your own unique way get rid of the excess in your life that's holding you back and just kind of follow your dreams and have the space and time to do what you want to do. So this is what you did in, in, in 2012 on your website, you left an office job and downsized and travel. Yes. So how did that come about? Well, I've always loved travel and always wanted to travel and always loved the freedom that came with travel. I think having the simplicity of getting away from all the clutter in my life and sort of like just living out of one bag and living in a new setting it really brings clarity to like what's important to you and what was all that stuff I was doing that was taking up so much time that I could only need. You're just a crew for your life, don't you? Exactly. And so I found I really thrived in when I was traveling and really started enjoying it from such a young age. Yeah. Yeah, you just see people come alive. And so I started traveling from a young age and knew I wanted to keep doing it. And I always thought, uh, I studied abroad in college and just wanted to take a trip through Latin America when I was done with college. And I ended up waiting for my partner who was finishing school for a few years and just really like chopping up a bit to get going. So I think by the time he was done with school, um, I was just like, I'm done. I'm quitting my job, I'm ready to go. But it's become a lifestyle, it wasn't just that you needed to take that one big trip. It's a lifestyle now, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I think I always sort of knew that, and I always sort of envisioned something more fluid, something that wasn't like a concrete home or a concrete, like, typical job. I really wanted something that felt more authentic for me and something that had the space for me to grow and change with it as my location has changed. Yeah, I know you just... I stay away from YouTube. Yes, and getting locked into something that I was just doing and not really checking in with myself and seeing if it was what I wanted to be doing. It seemed almost like an animalistic way to live, doesn't it? 
Yeah, it feels more primal, like... Yeah, just so sort of seeking out movies and things at the bottom of the mind and where do I, where do I want to be now, I want to... Yeah, yeah I love that. And you said on your website that um, some of your loved ones are your extreme and that <laughs> now extreme is a beautiful word for you. Yeah, it's so true, you know, like watching my diet change and my lifestyle change, so many people, especially my loved ones, have you know, been concerned at times and also just been like, you know, <laughs> Brittany, you're a little extreme, you're a little weird, and oh, well, not you can do that, but like, that's an extreme thing, like, no, not everybody's going to do that, and I, it was something I had to get used to, but now I really feel like Sometimes people are asking for permission for, for what they're doing to be okay, and I totally get that. And I think that in identifying other people as extreme, it's another way of saying, like, what exactly are you doing? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, for you now, that's a beautiful word. Um, because it's about being true to you, yourself, isn't it? But, yes. I mean, that makes so much sense, but it's not easy to do because, you know, we are social animals mm. and you know, it's so logical but it's so hard to do isn't it and your, your website your work is <coughs> trying to um, <coughs> help people find the strength is that right and to, to go in a similar direction and find themselves yes yeah. i think everybody's journey is different but i think to find that strength and security within yourself and to find the confidence to sort of pursue your own path even though the community around you might be doing something completely different. Um, and especially like your family and friends that you grew up with from a young age, you don't, you don't get to choose that necessarily. And I think the process of sort of moving towards what feels right for you and choosing your own new family and tribe can sometimes be hard for people. And I, I love to be able to offer just you know, maybe more remote community for people and to help them find that in their own house for themselves. And it definitely gives you, you know, it gives you more of that new community than your old community. Yes, I think I think by getting clearer on what we need, we can sort of pinpoint what it is that what, what our needs are and how we can get them met. And I don't think that people are brought up that way. I think that a lot of people are locked into routines that aren't necessarily serving them. Mm -hmm. Go on to go along. Yes. yes. So, um, is diet important? How, how important is diet to it? And, and um, I know you, you're into acro yoga. Yes. What, what role does these things serve you? For me, in my life, like the diet and movement and play is all so important. Um, I feel like I feel my best when I'm eating clean and I feel my best when I'm moving my body in fun ways that are playful for me. And I think I was too sick before I changed my diet to really enjoy all of my physical play. I was an athlete, but I was also just sick and suffering. And I just didn't have the energy to contemplate all the things I wanted to be contemplating or to to have the energy to move away from a conventional job. Like I just or to have the relationships I wanted to have. So changing my diet helped me feel well enough to just do the basic things. So, I so that, that whole past lifestyle, everything about it kind of locked you in place. Yes. That's what happens. Yes, and the diet was part of that lifestyle. And so I don't think there's like magical food or magical movement. I just think that by having a baseline of health, like getting your basic needs met, and we do have a need for fuel to fuel our bodies, and by putting the cleanest fuel in that we can, and the best fuel that feels right for us, then we're setting ourselves up for success to be able to live our dreams. Mm -hmm. And I think movement is an, an important aspect for like, our bodies. We need to move them for a lot of our like, physiological needs, and I think our society is a lot more sedentary than we were ever meant to be. And people are sick because of it. And that's not all food, a lot of that is movement for me. And I also think that, um, I think that these things are unique to everyone. Like there's no right, one right way to move or to eat, and I found what works for me, so to me they're super important, but I think it's more about finding what makes you tick and finding like what you're passionate about and 
how your diet is going to play into all that and your movement. You mentioned you were something to me about authentic and relating. Is that really important or am I yeah. So what, what is authentic and relating? Well, I think just on its own, it's kind of connecting with yourself and with others from an authentic place within you, a real place within you, and not giving programmed responses. And specifically over the last year, year plus, I've had the opportunity to play with an actual authentic relating community group in Austin, Texas, which has been such a cool experience to just come together with like-minded people who want to be doing that, who are interested in playing games that are geared around you know, putting us in situations that may be a little new or uncomfortable to cut past just the junk that we talk about with people that's not real. So what happens when you don't go through the program and you put nothing to in there? I mean, that is that when it gets uncomfortable? When you have nothing underneath yeah, the program well, you response. See, you see into it, you know, you're so used to your programs, that's, you know, is that where the discomfort comes from? How do you get to the authenticity, I guess, in terms of mm. and what, what is the authenticity? Easy question. No, you know, I think it's such a good question. And the first thing that came to mind when you said, like, what if nothing's underneath that? And so much of that in, like, minimalism and simplifying is, like, basking in the glory of that space yeah. and just being comfortable oh, yeah. there, owning it and being, like, be quiet, be, quiet, be with it, be open to what's going to come up or just relish in that open space. Because I sometimes find really that um, there is a leap from the, the sort of the heady programmed quick response to the genuine feeling. Yes. It's like a big leap there. Yeah. It's difficult to sort of bridge that chasm. And, um, you don't want to appear like a blank robot. Yes. You know? Yeah, I think there's, if, you can avoid it. <laughs> if you can, I think that there's definitely like a comfort in a comfort in that space and not having a program response and feeling at ease, maybe with yourself and just sitting with it and feeling comfortable with yourself then helps you, I think, feel comfortable with others in whatever situation that comes up. Some of these groups help you retake that territory. Yeah, and especially because they're in a safe, contained space where it's like, okay, we've all said we want to play this game, so I know that may involve me sitting here feeling like, uh, I don't know what to say right now, or I'm uncomfortable, and you've sort of already agreed that, like, I'll hold you in that space yeah. and it's okay. Nobody's going to add to your past trauma or anything. Like, yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. So do you, are you, what? Did you say that you were going to offer that? You can share that with people? Do you want to, is that part of your, your own business plan for you know, um, uh, sharing what's helped you and, and, and then sustaining your, your lifestyle? Is that something that you would be offer? Yeah, I feel like it's all really connected. And I feel like I've already started embodying it and maybe offering it in a way in my interactions. And I'd love to do more work with that. I've been talking with people about like how we can offer that in like you know more group settings in the future. And so you, you offer coaching in your time? I do. What yeah. Kind of coaching is that? Lifestyle, I guess. Whatever, whatever people are looking for. I think it comes down to a lot of the same stuff. Whether like maybe they'll come because they want to get rid of stuff in their house, like physical stuff in their house. But it turns out that you know they end up doing a lot of emotional clearing mm -hmm. and. And then that piece of authentic relating comes in, like, okay, like, how can I connect with myself and really find what's, what I've been using this clutter to sorry, sort of avoid dealing with? And when I clear it away, what's there? And can I sit in that space with myself? And can I love myself? Yeah. Because not everybody, obviously, they want to do different things to sort of stop it. To, to, to help ourselves feel better about where we're at. And cluttering is obviously something that is so key for you. Yes. Yeah. I've never really thought about that before, but that's what people do. They, they, they just amass stuff or you know, their house with them. Yes. Yeah. I grew up in a house full, full of quarters, and my parents, I just watched, I watched them all the time still, just they're 
it's emotional and it's physical simultaneously. And it's just like they're buying more things and and they're accumulating more junk in their life. And it's so interesting because I know they recognize it on some level, but it's this it's like an addiction or a pattern that they find some comfort in and the thought of breaking away from that is like so scary. It's like it's two folds, not this sense of trying to fill, fill a hole, but also you want to let go of things. Yes. Right. So, uh, do you want a business remotely, or do you want these people that has a business? Yeah. yeah, so I do this stuff around simple living and travel, and then I also um, manage websites for mostly yoga teachers and people in that sort of profession, um, which kind of was an offshoot of the job I used to do when I just started taking that. So, you live a pretty independent lifestyle. You live, are you living your dreams now, you say? Yeah, I think I am. And I think they're ever evolving. And I see them developing more in the future. But I really do feel like every day I get to wake up and say, what do I want to do today? And that's going to be my day. That's good. Yeah. Hey, babe. I'm gonna be coming around tonight I wanna put a bit of your finger 